Dr. Trindade is a teacher, author, and recognized international lecturer in functional medicine. After earning a bachelor's degree in biology, Dr. Trindade earned her master's in public health in environmental health and epidemiology prior to beginning medical school. She graduated first in her class in family practice from UC Davis School of Medicine in Sacramento, California, and completed residency training at University of California, San Francisco, affiliated Santa Rosa Family Medicine Residency. Dr. Trindade is both a graduate of and faculty for the Morsani College of Medicine at the University of South Florida in Tampa. She has been in clinical practice for more than 18 years. Prior, prior to starting her own private practice in 2004 in functional medicine, she was the medical director of a large nonprofit organization. Dr. Trindade is currently active in the development and teaching of programs in functional medicine in the United States, Latin America, and Europe. So she's very busy. So we'll let you get started. It's 12.01, Dr. Trindade, and you can get started with the program. Great. Thanks, Betsy. And welcome, everyone, to Clinical Pearls in Laboratory Testing. Now, this is a, a review of a workshop that was done by um, Dr. Smith, Dr. Carnahan, Dr. Patrick, uh, Dr. Lapine, Dr. Um, Krasinski, and myself back in May. And so what I did is I took the, when I felt were the most important pearls or the um, sort of information that I found really useful and that I may not have known. So I hope that it is useful to you as well. The main thing uh, that I wanted to start out with is some of the importance in definitions when, we're come, when it comes to food reactions, because this is extremely, extremely crucial when we're talking to our colleagues, uh, especially. So when we're talking about a food allergy, we can only be mentioning food allergies in the sense of Ig-mediated type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, when we're talking about food sensitivities, we're talking more about the IgG-mediated delayed hypersensitivity. So if we're talking about food sensitivities um, or food, quote-unquote, allergies, we really need to mention them as food sensitivities. Unlike food intolerance, which is a non-immunological reaction to a food, like lactose intolerance, for example. Just a few points to start off with as um, we are dealing with and treating our patients with food reactions. Now, a few of what I thought were really important pearls with respect to food sensitivities, um, food intolerances, food reactions, um, and food allergies, but in particular food sensitivities, was how do you treat it? What's a good sort of uh, protocol to have? What do you want to have in your toolbox? And so I'm going to go through the slides that um, mentioned what I thought were the most important um, supplements that we have at our disposal. Number one being bromelain, not necessarily the most important, but one of the most important. So bromelain is derived from a group of enzymes that are found in pineapple. It's used, usually used in combination with other immune modulating nutrients, such as quercetin and vitamin C. So when you're looking for a product to use, important to have those three. Remember that A can be anti-inflammatory, and you can use it with meals or between meals. When you're using it between meals, you're using it more for inflammation. With meals, it's um, more to help with the food digestion. And dose is usually 500 milligrams BID between meals. Remember that when you're using it with quercetin and vitamin C, as I mentioned it, usually it's 100 milligrams of the bromelain with 400 milligrams of um, quercetin, and you use it with each meal you know, three times a day. But also make sure that you're not using it with patients that are allergic to pineapple. Another one I have in our arsenal is N-acetylcysteine. Now, we know that N-acetylcysteine is a very potent antioxidant, and of course, it boosts levels of glutathione, and it's one of the primary antioxidants in the lower respiratory system. It is a mucolytic agent. It can thin out mucus, and uh, it can break up the um, sulfur bonds that hold it together. Now, it's also good for chronic stuffy nose, as you see, for example, in um, allergy season. And uh, you usually want to use doses of 1,500 milligrams daily for pretty severe congestion and 1,000 milligrams uh, more for mild symptoms. And it usually comes in 600 and um, 100 milligrams for uh, most nutraceutical companies. Now, remember that it can be used with other immune modulating therapies, as I mentioned before. But also, it's important to know whenever we're using a supplement, just like when we use a prescription drug, 
what are the side effects? What are the potential either nutrient depletions or, or side effects that it can have? In this case, n acetylcysteine can deplete zinc and copper, so you want to make sure that your patient is on those, or particularly taking a multivitamin that includes zinc, both zinc and copper. And also, if, in the, if you're using n acetylcysteine in a patient that's prone to kidney stones, you want to make sure that they're on vitamin C, particularly um, at 1,000 milligrams per day or more. I usually use 2,000 milligrams per day in my patients just to avoid that. And since, you know, and vitamin C is on any histamine, you know, if you're treating patients for allergies, you, you would most likely already be in vitamin C, but it's just important to be aware of that. Uh, quercetin is a flavonoid. It's a what's been referred to as a superstar flavonoids, and it can be a frontline treatment for allergy and asthma. It is, of course, anti-inflammatory, and it can stabilize the walls of mast cells, which then uh, prevent the release of histamine and serotonin. It's found in the skins of apples, yellow peppers, onions, and it's uh, usually found together with bromelain and also uh, vitamin C. So you're really enhancing its flavonoid activity. And it's better if you use it before your exposure, um, but with any of these, it's always before to use it before exposure, but you can use it as treatment as well, um, although, of course, before would be better. And it's uh, found with a bromelain, as I mentioned before, usually 400 milligrams of quercetin to 100 milligrams of bromelain and vitamin C it can be fi at least 500 milligrams. I tend to use a little bit higher doses because vitamin C is, is a great anti um, not just a great antioxidant, but it also can act as an antihistamine. Now, stinging nettles uh, works by inhibiting the release of tryptase, which is, um, again, a mast cell mediator of inflammation due to allergic response. And it's been a, shown to be effective for hay fever. It can inhibit the expression of many inflammatory gene markers like IL-2, IL-6, um, IL-8, and TNF-alpha. Usually you want to take about 300 milligrams with each meal, and you can take up to um, three capsules per day, so 900 milligrams. Now, it's important to know that it is a, a diuretic, and so it can increase the elimination of potassium from the body. So you may need to supplement with potassium and make sure patients are eating potassium-rich foods. Particularly, you want to be aware of this if patients are on prescription drugs, which may already affect potassium levels. And so you want to make sure that you, you have caution in using it in patients who are uh, pregnant or trying to conceive or have kidney or heart problems, particularly also due to the effects on potassium. Vitamin C, I already mentioned, uh, it is of course a natural antihistamine, and it's best for allergies if you take it on an ongoing basis, but it's just a great antioxidant to have our patients in, and um, it can promote vasodilation, but again, it's also immune system strengthener and can normalize immune function. So you may want to have our patients in it on an ongoing basis, and studies have shown that um, the uh, rate of asthma increases as the intake of vitamin C in the diet decreases. And doses are usually from 500 to 1,000 milligrams twice a day. But remember, it's water-soluble, and it's better taken um, throughout the day, so BID or TID. And I usually have patients on a little bit higher doses, like 2 to 3 grams a day. But, but remember, Linus Pauling was in. It was, you know, took much higher doses per day, but there is a ball tolerance, so you want to make sure you're aware of that. Now, another pearl, uh, particularly when we're talking about uh, food sensitivities, is um, to really look at the causes, right? Where are some of the causes of the food reactions? And one, or a very common cause, is low stomach acid that I feel we really need to be aware of. Whoops, sorry, I'm having problems with my screen here. Um, this is just not my day when it comes to working on computers. Okay, so uh, now with hypochlorhydria, of course, you still want to find the root cause, but, but you want to consider it in patients with allergies or food sensitivities uh, because, of course, it's going to uh, affect your, uh, your potential for developing a food sensitivity as well as a food allergy. So always consider that in your patients that are presenting uh, with food sensitivities. Now, you still have to find the root cause of why the patient became hypochlorhydric, and one very common in the United States is the abundant use of PPIs, right, proton pump inhibitors, unfortunately. 
and uh, realize that also changes in the gut microbiome can do that. But using PPIs in itself can also uh, change the gut microbiome. But you want to consider low HCL on any conditions, uh, particularly in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, and you want to work to try and find out if the food allergies that you're seeing are a consequence of the low stomach acid or if they have contributed to it. So just remember to consider uh, hypochlorhydria in your patients with allergies and particular food allergies and food sensitivities. But also we want to be aware of what caused the low HCL, but what are the consequences of low HCL? And I, I feel that in my clinical experience and in talking with a lot of other providers and particularly you know, people in the fellowship is to consider what are some of the downstream effects, uh, particularly with respect to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Because when we're talking, when at least in my experience, when we're talking about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we often forget to look at, is it a problem in digestion? Is it a problem in absorption? Uh, you know, what led to this change in sort of our gut that would allow bacteria to migrate up? So from the large intestine into the small intestine. So consider low stomach acid as being in your differential diagnosis as one of the potential causes for SIBO. Also consider dysbiosis, but chronic candida infections, but mineral deficiencies as well, particularly calcium, manganese, zinc, iron, chromium. But with zinc, remember we need zinc to make HCL. So you may have low HCL due to a deficiency of zinc, uh, but if you have low HCL, you also cannot extract uh, zinc from your food. So it's a double-edged sword in a sense. But also don't consider, uh, don't forget B12 deficiency as being a consequence of low stomach acid, as well as low ferritin anemia. And I see a lot of low ferritins in uh, my patients. So always consider if low stomach acid could be uh, a cause. To me, it almost seems like it's, there's a big epidemic of low HCL. Now, there's a, a cause, some other causes of low stomach acid. Consider, of course, that as we get older, you know, we have a propensity to uh, make less stomach acid. And, uh, of course, I already mentioned PPIs, but also in autoimmune conditions or patients that may have been fasting and other chronic medical conditions. And one particularly really large one, stress, big cause of can be a big cause of low stomach acid, particularly in those patients that have been in this sympathetic dominant state. Because remember that food, or I always say rest and digest, is under the parasympathetic nervous system. And some of the symptoms that you can um, look for in your patients, particularly bloating or belching after meals. So I always say gas and bloating are a big one, uh, but also it can be intolerance for protein, rectal itching, which we all often think is associated with parasites, but it can also be low stomach acid. You can look at fingernails, and there can be peeling or cracked. Uh, but I especially see a lot of vertical ridges or deep ridges in your nails is, of course, a sign of low HCL. But adult acne or, ratio, or, or rosacea can also be a symptom of uh, or a sign that you find with patients with lo low stomach acid. And, of course, asking our patients about what their stool looks like and considering and I just the food found in um, the stool. Now, also remember that um, changes in the gut microbiome can lead to immune reactions uh, to foods, and that's particularly important. So you really want to look at and consider um, the gut microbiome when you're looking at food sensitivities. And we know that a dysbiosis can be correlated with food sensitivities and food uh, intolerances. But also realize that um, many of the uh, probiotic strains that we have um, to alleviate food allergy really resides in their ability to modify food antigens, but also to repair gut barrier function and balance, you know, our a altered microbiome, as well as restore, you know, some, some local and systemic immune regulation. So extremely important to consider the gut microbiome. And of course, when we're talking about the gut microbiome, we need to look at, well, what are the best tools that we have available to evaluate that? And to me, it's really looking at the GI effects, where you can look at digestion and absorption, as well as inflammation and immunology, if you will, as well as looking at the microbiome or DIG. Um, it's a great sort of um, way to consider when uh, we're looking at the potential uh, benefits of doing a GI 
uh, effects because there's a lot that we can do. Uh, there's a lot of information that we can glean from it, and some so, sometimes even very small changes in the GI effects um, can give you a lot of information of what's going on with that particular patient. Also, don't forget about exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, which is now an ICD-10 diagnostic code. And I think we're getting pretty good at looking at it in patients with celiac disease. But also, don't forget about looking for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in patients with SIBO. But in my clinical practice, I consider it in any patient that has any GI symptoms. So if patients are complaining of whether it's just gas or, or bloating or any concern that they have digestive-wise, I want to look at exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And of course, you get your pancreatic elastase from the GI effects. So you get an idea of what's going on with the exocrine pancreatic function. Now, other things that you also want to consider is things like 3-methylhistidine, which is not on GI effects, but you can find it in uh, your organic acid testing or in the NutriVal. And remember that 3 methyl Histidine um, can, be, can be assigned for a poor breakdown of proteins in the diet. And when you see that, you really want to suspect hypochlorhydria in that patient. So another tool that we have sort of at our disposal. And I cannot say enough about the NutriVal because I feel that there's so much information that we can glean from it that we then take to our patient and really try and figure out how it uh, sort of coincides with the symptoms that our patients came in with as well as our findings on our physical exam. So remember that you get organic acids, you get amino acids, you get your fatty acids in the RBC, you get oxidative stress markers, and of course you can also add your nutrient and toxic elements, your vitamin D, as well as some genomic markers. Now remember that when it comes to um, digestion, there's a few other things that you can also look at. Um, I had mentioned already your um, 3 methyl um, histidine, but you can also get an idea of 1 methyl histidine, although it's not as good a marker for low HCL because it is found in meat eaters. But you can also look at anisine, I'm sorry, anserine, carnosine, and uh, beta alanine. And for example, if you see an increased beta alanine, um, it may be an independent marker of abnormal gut fermentation. So if you're doing both a GI effects as well as a NutriVal, you can really put that information together and do a lot in assessing your patient and developing a treatment protocol. But if you're just doing organic acids, you can also get an idea of what's going on in the gut. Now, when it comes to anserine and carnosine, if they're elevated, especially when you have low or uh, low normal amino acids, it can be a sign of incomplete a digestive proteolysis or, or a proteolysis, sorry, or a leaky gut. So it's important that you consider all these different markers that we can then put together and really um, help our patients. Now, I put this slide in because I think I often forget just how amino acids, uh, how important they are in the health of our patient and how patients can present with so many different symptoms that are associated with Amino, amino acid deficiencies. So to me, it's really important that you look at that. And of course, you get the amino acids in your um, NutriVal. Now, these next two, two slides are from a patient of mine, and they're from the same patient that really taught me a lot about the importance of the NutriVal, but also to read it in the context of what is going on with a patient. So this is a patient of mine that came in and had a lot of symptoms complained of a lot of fatigue and have a, 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 an autoimmune condition. She actually had Crest syndrome. And when I did the first NutriVal, I was surprised because I expected to find a lot of nutrient deficiencies. And it was mostly just B3 and B6 that were low. And then she had a couple borderline things, but not a lot. I, I was really expecting it to sort of light, light up in, in the red in many different categories. And it didn't. So I was thinking, okay, what, what's going on? But in any case, there were a few things there. She also had some low amino acids. There was a, quite a bit going on digestive-wise. So I fixed that and was working with her. And then three to four months later, I repeated the NutriVal. And this taught me an extremely important clinical pearl that I wanted to, to share with you. Because this next slide is that same patient after three and a half, actually it was four months after the initial NutriVal. And what I found is, oh my gosh, now she's got a high need and a lot of her B vitamins. Why is that? Because initially I didn't see that, at least not in the initial NutriVal. And the 
pearl here is that whenever you have a condition where the body is not getting necessarily what it needs, it tends to downregulate those pathways. So if it needs more B vitamins, it may downregulate some of those pathways. Uh, but as soon as you start to supplement, it's sort of like the gates are open, and now they're showing a higher need because those reactions are turned on that had been sort of slowed down. So if you have a, a result similar to this in your patients, it does not mean that what you're doing isn't working or that they're not getting better. It means that the body is now getting some of what it needs, so it's going to show its total need. So it has a much higher need for those supplements. So this really taught me a lot, and I hope that um, it helps you in your clinical experience. Now, this sort of B vitamins leads, of course, into the methylation cycle, and I wanted to just do cover a couple slides on how the methylation cycle affects our health. And we know that um, methionine or acid methionine is extremely important, it's sort of the universal methyl donor, but I think methionine sometimes gets a little bit uh, forgotten, and that's extremely important uh, because it is not only a precursor for acid and acetylmethionine, uh, but it can, it's also important of mRNA, and it's a lipotropic, which I actually didn't know initially. So it's, it's really important that you consider that, but also realize that when you're looking at a methylation pathway, it's, um, you want to look at just having the right level. So too little is not good, but also too much can increase your levels of oxidative stress. And methylation can affect many um, health conditions cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, gut disorders, but osteoporosis is one that I actually wasn't aware of, so that high or elevated homoce homocysteine correlates with increased risk of fracture as well as osteopenia. Now, I think with respect to the neurodegenerative conditions and cognitive decline and mood disorders, we're a little bit more sort of aware of that, but I think it's, it's really important to realize just how important in general methylation is. And that, you know, there's many um, health conditions that can affect the methylation cycle, uh, such as someone who's had a traumatic brain injury, where you can see um, decrease in plasma methionine as well as acid and acetyl methionine, but also like a tissue-proven non-alcoholic um, steatohepatitis also can affect, you know, the methylation cycle, as well as alcoholic liver disease. You know, chronic uh, alcohol exposure can induce CYP. 2E1 enzymes and increase your oxidative uh, stress and your reactive oxygen species. So really important to realize that um, methylation is involved in a lot of different reactions, but there's also some health conditions that affect the methylation cycle. Sort of goes both ways. Now, in terms of the methylation cycle and really looking at your uh, the enzyme function, I think it's important that we also consider that there's a lot of different things that can affect the enzymes. So it can be affected by single nucleotide polymorphisms, right, as we all know, particularly, for example, the 677T in folate metabolism, but also nutritional status, that most of those pathways require cofactors that we may not um, initially be aware of or that may not be uh, sort of in the meth meth stated in a methylation cycle if you're looking at a schematic, for example, but as well as a lot of toxic exposures uh, that we're faced from our environments that alter reactive uh, our oxidative reactive species, but are also inflammation. So extremely, extremely important. And of course, there's also fed uh, metabolic feedback loops that can affect it. Now, we can't sort of talk about the methylation cycle without also looking at uh, toxins as well as our ability to detoxify, which I think is becoming more and more um, sort of affected by this um, polluted environment, you know, that we live in. So I thought that this was an extremely um, sort of eye-opening um, paper that was talking about the, that the family practice doctor will see illnesses that are related to environmental exposure to toxic metals in about two out of five patients in their practice. And the fact is that I don't feel like, you know, traditional medicine has really been focusing on looking at toxins and detoxification. So it's really for those of us that, you know, practice functional or integrative medicine to really look at that and say, you know, this is a, this is a really important uh, problem in our environment. And we basically uh, 
they are exposed to a lot of different environment toxicants, not just heavy metals, but according to the National Haines data, you know, there's measurable levels of endocrine disruptors in about 90 percent representative sample of the American population. And we know that some of those have associations with disease, but others have actually shown causation. PCBs, for example, we know can actually cause metabolic diseases, particularly diabetes and insulin resistance. And so we've talked, heard a lot about bisphenol A, for example, but there's also a lot of phthalates and there's other bisphenols that are extremely important, um, not just in you know, the area of heavy metals, because these are toxins that have long half-lives and so they are persistent and they bioaccumulate. They can live in our tissues as well as in our, in our environment for many, many years. So really having a good detoxification protocol is important. Let's just focus on heavy metals for um, a little while and let's start with mercury. You know, why is it so toxic? I, I, you know, I've often asked this question. Well, it's because it can penetrate in many different you know, of our organs, particularly the brain, and it can be stored in the kidneys, and it can also bind very tightly to our sulfhydryl groups, and it's hard to chelate because if you're already in this toxic, toxic milieu where we may have lower glutathione levels, it's much harder for our body to chelate it, and we need to have high glutathione levels, but also because we have sulfation and methylation slips, so it makes it a little bit more difficult to chelate, and you need to have really healthy glomerular function, which can be damaged by other heavy metals, such as cadmium and lead. And we also need to have really good general antioxidant support, like vitamin C, for example. Now, this is something that I thought I've um, believed for a long time, and I still um, have difficulty interacting with some of my colleagues that uh, don't are not aware of sort of the literature. But the fact that amalgam-related mercury exposure exceeds that from fish or other sources for the majority of the population. So extremely important when we do a physical exam, we look for amalgams and we discuss uh, with our patients if they have amalgam fillings and need to get them removed, then we need to prepare them, you know, for the removal. But the fact that this vapor outgassing for amalgam fillings is at a rate of 2 to 28 micrograms per facet surface per day, and 80% of that is absorbed through the GI tract, to me that's really scary. And it really um, sort of signifies the importance of educating our patients. So. This means that we really need to be looking at the toxic load of our patients or toxicant load. And this is one of the reasons why I love the core effects profile uh, because, or the toxic core effects profile, because it really helps us figure out exactly what is the total toxic load you know, of our patients. Because we can look at the organophosphates, the bisphenol A, your, your phthalates, as, as well as your granochlorine and your PCBs, because we know that these have been associated with many different types of conditions or diseases from cardiometabolic syndrome to obesity to diabetes to infertility, you know, to low testosterone. You know, more and more I'm seeing younger men with low testosterone levels. And the solution isn't to replace testosterone to start off with. It's really to look at the underlying reason why. You know, when you see a 30-year-old with low testosterone, you want to try and figure out why. And then most likely they're toxic and we need to develop a detoxification program for them. And so how do we do that? How do we detoxify and eliminate and eliminate toxic metals? Well, I think we really have to first, you know, decrease exposure and then really support detoxification and excretion and really work with a lot of the intermediates or the cofactors that are needed for both phase one and phase two detoxification of the liver. And then I think sometimes we forget that there's vitamins that serve as cofactors in both phase one and phase two. I think we all realize that phase one is an oxidation reaction and phase two is more conjugation, but uh, where I think we fall short, and myself included, is in all the cofactors that are needed, such as zinc and selenium and vitamin A, D, E, K, and vitamin C for phase one, for example, as well as many of the B vitamins and amino acids for phase two. So extremely important. I feel like with respect to B vitamins that they're really needed and no matter what phase of detoxification you're talking about. But also to 
look at the gut and realize that we detoxify a lot through the gut and so we really need to normalize what's going on in the gut use the 5r uh, treatment program for example and look at what's going on in the microbiome but also don't forget about the bile and the fact that a lot of things can be interhepatically recirculated so they can go from the gut to the bile and back and they can also be stored in the bile and so i think that it's really important that we start sort of with a natural detoxification even before we do a pharmaceutical one starting off with food and how and avoidance and how much can we include in terms of supplements um, with our patients but to me sort of food and increasing antioxidants is foundation and then you add your other support for both phase one and phase two with our, uh, pharmaceuticals now, I think that we are in a sort of time uh, in the world, and I see this throughout cultures and throughout countries, where everybody has a sort of morbid fear of germs, this melismophobia. And um, I recently had an experience where my father was hospitalized and he was in the ICU, and the nurses or um, the any worker, but particularly the nurses, as soon as they would get ready to walk into his room, they would use these hand sanitizers instead of you know washing your hands and the fact is that hand sanitizers are toxic in of themselves um, ticlosan for example is found in hand sanitizers as well as antimicrobial soaps and a lot of deodorants and and detergents but you know we need to realize that sometimes what we're trying to sort of avoid or uh, treat is sometimes part of the poison so it's really important that we're aware of that and ticlosan now we know is an endocrine disruptor, just like bisphenol A, and it can have immune suppressive effects. So we need to be aware of that because for a long time there was sort of a, a controversy of whether or not um, triclosan was really dangerous, and indeed it is. And also too, we need to consider what are some of the associations, if not um, sort of downstream effects, of some of our other toxins, particularly pesticides, which have been you know, associated with increased risk of asthma, as well as eczema, and that it can decrease our natural, kill, natural killer cell function, uh, whether you're talking about you know, organophosphates or carbamates. So just really important that we realize that there is literature out there that supports this. And when it comes to detoxification, one thing that I have not mentioned is the importance of amino acids. I talked about it a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, with respect to phase two and the fact that it's a conjugation reaction. But um, aside from being a conjugation reaction, it also uses amino acids. So if our patients are not properly digesting their food and breaking it down into amino acids, that can be a major problem. So it's another part of the NutraVal that I feel is really important to look at is at our levels of amino acids and making sure that they're adequate. And if you suspect, you know, uh, that the deficiency in your patient is more recent, you might want to do the amino acids in the urine, whereas if it's longer, you might want to do in the plasma. I tend to do both. But another one extremely important for detoxification is the B vitamins, which I already mentioned. But also be aware that deficiency of certain B vitamins increases the toxicity of some of these toxins. So for example, B1 deficiency can increase the toxicity of PCBs. And I already mentioned PCBs uh, uh, can are associated with many different metabolic diseases, but they can actually cause insulin resistance and diabetes. And, B, and also B1 deficiency is associated with um, inducing CYP1A1 and 1A2, uh, which is extremely important when we're talking about estrogen metabolism, which I'll deal with towards the end of my talk. And dialgin toxicity increases the need um, or, or the toxicity is increased in patients that are deficient in riboflavin. So really we want to look at all the B vitamins and consider them when you're doing a good detoxification protocol. But vitamin A, for example, and carotenoids are extremely um, important because they can uh, be decreased by organophosphates. And so I, I've recently been patients for vitamin A and I've had deficiencies. So it's a look for the reason why root cause or causes and could this be a toxin? Because I find more and more uh, with my patients, a lot of the um, symptoms that they're having are really due to different toxins. And in many cases, or I'd say in most cases, it's more the more one. And so you have to sort of be 
aware of that. Now switching gears, one other thing that I wanted to mention um, that I just have a couple slides on is on Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is really the great mimicker. And it, the one thing that from this conference in Lyme disease is that it is a great imitation. Patients are not getting better and you've sort of already developed a treatment protocol and you're not really getting the results that you expect, particularly in our extremely fatigued patients. Don't forget to consider Lyme disease uh, and that that could be one of the problems. But also, the other pearl that I wanted to mention is the co-infections, which are extremely important in Lyme disease. So although Lyme disease is a great imitator, it also is usually present with a lot of co-infections. And these are organisms that are very common in patients with Lyme disease, and it may, it's a major cause of treatment failure um, if the infections are not recognized. And these can be bacterial co-infections like Mycoplasma, Bardinella, Rickettsia, Tularemia, Brucella, but they can also be fungal, such as Candida, um, they can be parasitic, like Babesia, as well as your intestinal parasites, so another reason to do our GFX, for example. But they can also be viral, uh, things like Epstein-Barr virus and CMV. So it's really important that we look for all of those in our patients. And I always say, you also want to do a good functional medicine approach with any patient that you suspect Lyme uh, because you want to make sure that they're absorbing, that they're breaking down their food, and that you want to look, do a nutrient analysis. You want to look at their gut. So you want to do a total sort of analysis to make sure of what's going on with them. And when it comes to um, treating, whether it's Lyme or any other inflammatory disease, there's a couple of things that were mentioned that I thought was extremely important. And these are different ways to, to tackle inflammation and particularly looking at nerve tube functions um, and how can you increase it. So nerve two is really sort of a sensor in the cytoplasm that can regulate your redox balance and the stress response. And it is activated by oxidative stress. And it goes into the nucleus, binds to the ARE, the antioxidant response element, um, and activates phase two enzymes. But I, I think it's really important that we realize that there are different things that we can use that can help us in this aspect. So there's some nerve two activators, and these are all things you're all really aware of. Things like curcumin and sulforaphane and resveratrol and green tea, or the real, really the EGCG in green tea. And so I think it's really important that we start off with food and we include this in our diet as well. And then we supplement uh, because, you know, you can't get it with example with people. So you want to supplement. You may not be able to get enough uh, for more food. Now, curcumin uh, is one of my favorite anti-inflammatory supplements, and it reduces inflammation by aiding to translocate um, NRF2 to the, to the nucleus and then activate the ARE. Um, but there are um, many different uh, activities or things that it does. It can... Um, or rather that it can inhibit, it can decrease inflammation through all these different pathways. So one really important sort of uh, one to have in our, in our toolkit when we're trying to find inflammation. I wanted to switch gears just a little bit and look um, and talk more about uh, cardiovascular disease because that was another of the um, topics covered when we're talking about uh, laboratory testing, looking at how do we best assess? How can we best assess cardiovascular risk in our patients? Because whether you're a man or a woman, our number one cause of death in the U.S. is still heart disease. It's not cancer. It's heart disease. And I feel that we've done a pretty good job of trying to assess it in men, but not so in women. And women in the menopause, perimenopause, menopause, our risk, our rates, and our cardiovascular risk goes up much higher than men. So we really need to be looking at that in our women. And the best way to assess cardiovascular risk is not just by your total LDL, but it's by your LDL particle number using nuclear magnetic resonance, such as the CV Health, for example. And I like doing the CV Health Plus. Now, we've known this for a long time. Since 2007, we've known that a better way to measure cardiovascular risk is by looking at LDL particles with nuclear magnetic resonance. But I feel that it is still not being adopted in this. And um, 
get an identical number by April B for but if you can get the LDL part number it's, it's much much um, a better measure now when I'm in Europe um, I can't get in the LDL particle number. Unfortunately, not in the U.S. I have to have the, um, I'm sorry, not in, in Europe, in most countries, particularly not in Portugal, we're able to get it out of the um, United Kingdom, for example, or I have to order the tests in the U.S. and have it done. So you can approximate it with ApoB, for example, for the LDL particle number. But in the U.S. we're able to do it, and it is covered by most insurances. So extremely, extremely important that we look at. So when we're looking at LDL particle number, what we know is that it's important that we look at the particle number and that, that can vary even for the same level of total LDL so that you want that the numbers and that's what determines the risk, not just your LDL, your total LDL. So extremely important to be aware that the particle number is our biggest determinant of risk. Particle size is also important, but it's the particle number that, or the number of particles, that it's the biggest determinant of risk. And so let's just review a couple studies, um, particularly on women, uh, because we know the women with discordant LDL measures, you, we are really underestimating um, our rates of cardiovascular disease. So we don't want to just use LDL for total LDL. We want to be the LDL particle number, because you can have a low LDL total LDL and a very high LDL number. That's what they mean by dependent. And it's a number that it's the biggest determinant. Now, I'm talking about women in the menopause, that's extremely important. I don't want to be doing those examples looking at LDL part of her and some of the, some other women, particularly young women with PCOS. Now, this is a consistent statement by the Androgen Excess and the Polycystic Ovarian Syndrome Society that says that we really need to be looking at LDL particle number in order to assess risk in our patients. And so if we have a patient with, PCC, with PCOS, we want to be doing the expanded panels earlier rather than later. And this is just an example of what one looks like. And let me just tell you a little bit about this patient. Um, this is a 40-year-old uh, patient on a very low a uh, fat diet who can, uh, was high or low. Now, if you just look at your traditional panel on the left, you can see that the LDL is pretty good. His total cholesterol is good, but his triglycerides are high. So anytime you see high triglycerides, to me, that's almost synonymous with insulin resistance. They may not be diabetic or even be pre-diabetic, but you need to consider insulin resistance. And if you look on the right side, you can see that the LDL particle number it's suboptimal, you want it 900, uh, and they also have the small um, unhealthy pattern B, which uh, we want more of the large pattern A. In addition, his homocysteine is elevated and his CRP is high. So we would not be getting all of the risk factors that are really important to him by just looking at a traditional panel. So extremely important that we look at our expanded panels. Also realize that when you're doing an expanded panel, um, which this one I just showed you here is uh, an example of the CV Health. You can also do what's called the CV Health Plus, where you're looking at the primary SNPs that are related to cardiovascular um, health and blood coagulation. Those are also included. So your APOE, for example, your MTHFR, your Factor II, as well as your Factor V Leiden. So that comes as, as an add-on, or you can do your cardiovascular, um, when you're doing your cardiovascular panels, a CV Health Plus. Now, the prothrombin G2021 uh, OA mutation is extremely important because individuals who are carrying this have a two to three fold risk of developing thrombosis. So it's, it's important that that's included. It's one of the reasons why it's included in the CV Health. And you can be either um, homozygous or um, heterozygous, but it's now, interesting that in one case control study found that there was an increased risk of developing an ischemic cerebrovascular event in men who were under 60 years of age if they had the prothrombin, uh, this prothrombin mutation. Factor V Leiden is another uh, important one. It's an anticoagulant protein that, uh, which in, is normally inhibits the 
co-clotting factor of factor V, but is not able to bind normally to factor V, which then leads to this hypercoagulable state. And it's the most common hereditary hypercoagulability disorder that is found among um, ethnic Europeans. So extremely important to also look at that. And the risk of thromboembolism re increases with the mutation, either 7 to 10 fold with a heterozygous mutation and 30 to 100 fold with a homozygous, homozygous mutation. It's also been associated with a 2 to 3 fold increased in relative risk for pregnancy loss. So one extremely one, important one to look at. And of course, um, there it used to be pretty controversial whether or not there was an association with increased risk for MI, uh, but its recent study last year showed that yes, indeed there is, which sort of put, it was a very well done study, which um, kind of um, sort of uh, changed the controversy. Now let's look a little bit uh, into estrogen metabolism before I take on some questions. So there's different panels that you can do for estrogen metabolism with Genova. My favorite one is a complete hormones uh, because not only do you get all the metabolites when we're looking at estrogen uh, or actually all the hormones when we're looking at hormone balancing, uh, particularly um, if you're going to start or have already started someone on HRT, you can't use the urine to... Um, dose, but you can really use it to look at which enzymes are turned on and what are the metabolites, as well as what's going on with the SNPs. Because with, with respect to estrogen metabolism, it's really looking at the estrogen uh, metabolism SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms that can be used to determine someone's risk, particularly for prostate cancer in men and breast and other hormone-related cancers in women. So realize that there could be SNPs in both phase one and phase two. And with respect to estrogen in phase one, there's three main pathways that it can go under, the CYP1A1, the CYP3A4, and the CYP1B1. So the 2-hydroxy, or the safest, or what I call the good, um, is the CYP1A1. And the 16-hydroxy, or what I call the bad, is CYP3A4. And the ugly, or the CYP1B1, which can lead to your 4-hydroxyestrone and to your 3, 4-quinones which can cause DNA addicts and lead to cancer, is the, the four pathway, or the CYP1B1. The nice thing is that these, the, even though you may be genetically predetermined to use one pathway, it can be changed, right? We can bypass that, and we know how to do that. And also it's important that we realize that many of our xenoestrogens and many of our endocrine disruptors can sort of force our estrogens to be predominantly go down the 4-hydroxy pathway to be metabolized through the 4-hydroxy pathway, even though it's usually a minor pathway. And also that the conjugated equine estrogens preferentially use the 4-hydroxy pathway. And I know that anybody who's doing hormone replacement is not using conjugated equine estrogens, but uh, at least in this population, right? In our audience, but I still get patients that are taking the conjugate equine estrogens in my practice, unfortunately, and it's really important that we educate them about, you know, what the harm they're doing. And as, this is just um, a study showing how the endocrine disruptors can produce a higher ratio of the 4 and the 16 hydroxylated um, estrogens that are more genotoxic. And so it's important that we realize it's not just about the genetics, it's also about our exposures, and particularly our toxic exposures that can do that. And so in phase one, I already talked about the three main pathways. In phase two, we have methyltransferase, And when we have a polymorphism, um, it's in phase one, it's usually associated with an increased activity in that pathway. But in phase two, it's associated with a decreased enzyme activity. So for example, in this patient where they will have a homozygous COMT, they have a much decreased ability to methylate. So if they have an increase in phase one, but then let's say they're using more of the uh, CYP1B1 or the four pathway, and they have a down-regulated or a decreased activity of COMT, catecholamine methyltransferase, they can't process those toxins. So they may have more reactive intermediates, but they can't process them, unfortunately. And so you end up having more of the poor carcinogenic 4-hydroxyestrogens that can then form um, DNA addicts. So it's extremely important that we realize um, both that we need to look at both phase one and phase two. I think we've done a really good job of looking at uh, phase one. We're looking at two to 16 ratio, but not so much as looking at the methylation in phase two, as well as the glutathione conjugation. 
One pearl, other pearl that I want to leave you with is the fact that um, a SNP in COMT is really important with the methylation of your estrogens, right, in the metabolism process. However, it is also what breaks down catecholamines. And so if you have a SNP and COMT, you have an impaired clearance of those catecholamines. And those are those patients that are more nervous, they're anxiety, um, they're anxious, they um, have more increased sensitivity to pain, and they may not be, because they may not be able to clear their um, catecholamines or the neurotransmitters. So it's really important that um, Dr. Trindade, I think your sound has come out. Okay, well, we'll just give Dr. Trindade a, a, a minute to come back and see if her sound comes back. We had a few questions that we were going to ask her and see if we can reconnect with her. And we apologize that the sound has had some issues, um, but we kept going on, and I think we, we all appreciate that for um, the, the information that Dr. Trindade has been able to give us. I don't know that Dr. Trindade is going to be able to make it back on. We do have the questions, and um, we have information. We can answer those um, and try to reach you back with those answers. Okay, so I think this will have to conclude the uh, presentation, and we very much appreciate you joining us today. Thank you.